All right. So, welcome to Modern Philosophy. I know we're running a little behind on schedule, so I'm going to move us forward. Uh, the first thing that I want to go over is the reading we did from Michel de Montaigne. My, I'm not really French. My last name is French, but I don't really know how to say this in French. Montaigne. Um, he was before Descartes. So um, this is a predecessor, and actually, I think, a, a good influence. Uh, good in the sense of like a noteworthy influence on Descartes. Um, so Descartes, or Montaigne had a very cultured background. He was considered to be um, one of the most important thinkers from the French Renaissance period. Um, Montaigne does not ever write a systematic work. Instead, he writes these little essays. And what do you, this sort of created a brand new genre of writing. Um, one of the things, we're going to talk more about what that means in a moment. Another thing that's interesting is about his skepticism. And if you remember, I know you read this maybe three weeks ago, but he's got a very kind of skeptical angle on a number of different things in life. And the question is, and we're going to revisit this, is why? What was his aim in being skeptical? Then, the other thing to think about is to look for his influence on Descartes. And so as we look at these things in Montaigne, see how these things might link up with what Descartes is doing. Um, a little more about his background. His father, Pierre Iquem, was a wealthy merchant. In some of his memoirs, uh, Montaigne des describes him as the best father who ever was. <coughs> Very sweet. Uh, his mom, Antoinette, came from a wealthy family. And if you think about it, back in this time, um, you really didn't get a good education unless you came from a pair of very wealthy parents. Um, as an infant, so this is kind of weird about his life, his dad had him live with a poor family in order to cultivate a devotion to, quote, that class of men that needs our help. So his parents sent him off <laughs> to be raised by a bunch of poor people in order so that he would have this like fondness for the poor. As a young child, he was taught Latin as his native tongue and did not hear French until the age of six. Once again, that's kind of a, a, an odd thing. Like Nobody really spoke Latin in their everyday lives. Uh, later in life, he developed a strong friendship with... Uh, Etienne Le Boite. Let's see, I don't know how to say these words. If anybody's like a French major, anybody speak French? Know how to put the accents on the right syllables? Well, um, ha she had a very meaningful influence on his life, and sh she ended up dying in 1563, though. And in 1565, he married Francois de la Chassaigne, and they had six children. However, only one named Lenore, survived in infancy. This is kind of interesting with Descartes, when you're talking about his life, his daughter also died young. This is not an uncommon thing in this period. I mean, life expectancy and medical care are things that were very different back then compared to what they are today. And it's important to think about these influences and what their world looked like as um, you look at their philosophy and how that might differ from the way we even think about what is valuable and important in, in life. Um, Montaigne made a living by being a magistrate and a mayor. One of the things he was trying to do is create peace between Catholics and Protestants. The Protestant Reformation began in 1517. So by this time we have full you know, separation of countries and religions and people aren't really sure what to do. Montaigne um, what really worked, it was trying to say that, that this is okay, like we can still be friends, there's no need for us to go to war over these sorts of things. Um, so what we're reading is an excerpt from the essays. Um, and the essays can be translated as to tempt, <coughs> to test, to attempt, to experiment, to exercise... So think about these collection, these essays, what are they trying to do here? It's maybe, and this is what a lot of people think about Montaigne's writing. He's not writing necessarily to tell you what to think. 
He's really writing in order just to get you to think. So he's trying to write provocative pieces that when you read them, you respond to them. You don't just say, oh, that makes a lot of sense, I agree with you, but you go, what? How is that so? Well, what did he say about this, or what about that? That should be your reaction as you read these things. So maybe what he's trying to do here is he's putting together writings that are supposed to bring out from you what's within. Um, as I said, these are not systematic, meaning they don't go through things in sort of a logical order and cover and explain or discuss everything. All it is is sort of a haphazard collection of thoughts on this idea than that idea. And in fact, uh, you get a little bit of that sense even from what we read in our selection from our text. Um, he says that the goals of this are to promote self-knowledge and reflection, to cultivate judgment, to explain his own strange life. And it came out in three editions. This is, was also reflected in your text, where the regular edition, what was in the, the first edition is just the text you find. The second edition that came out in 1588 has one set of brackets around it, and then what came out in 1595 had two sets of brackets around it. So that's what all that stuff meant, if you remember from the reading. So here's actually, this is kind of cool. I found a copy of what the essays, this is an original first edition face of the, the essays. Um, the themes that I want you to be thinking about as we go through this piece are skept his skepticism, and once again the question is, what is the purpose of his skepticism? Why was he raising skeptical questions? The second has to do with the changing, how the changing subject, meaning not like subject matter, but like you as the knowing subject, how that affects the possibility of knowledge. And looking ahead, as I keep saying, look for how this is going to influence Descartes. Any questions about that material before we... This is all prelude to diving into the text. What we're reading is a selection of the essays. The title of it is An Apology for Raymond Sivan. Years before he wrote the essays, Montaigne was asked by his father to translate Raymond Sivan's work of natural theology. What is natural theology? Natural theology is trying to use reason to establish certain truths about religion, in particular that there is a God. Um, so, this book is supposed to be a... Um, oh, and the word apology, you need to remember, in, if it, any of you read Plato's Apology? Anybody read the Apology in their Intro to Philosophy or anything else? When Plato wrote the Apology, it's a speech that Socrates gives in his defense in court. The word apology just means a defense. So, notice... One thing, this is an apology. He's not like apologizing that Raymond Sivan wrote this work. He's writing a defense of Raymond Sivan. Now, this is very confusing because you might wonder how can this radical skepticism that we find in the essay be a defense of religious dogma? How can skepticism support religious belief? We often think of skeptics as being opposed to people who believe in religion. We'll see what we might come up with at the end of our discussion of this work. One of the big themes that we're going to look at right, right now is the theme of how appearance differs from reality. Appearance is one thing, the reality is a different thing. Um, so let's open up your book, if you have it, let's turn to page 5. We're going to be doing a lot of this sort of thing where I say, open up your book, let's look at this page. So if you don't, you need to bring your book in order to be prepared for class. Um, bring it with you. And I just want to read out loud our uh, first two paragraphs here and talk about this.
So he says, this discussion has brought me to the consideration of the senses, in which we find the greatest foundation and proof of our ignorance. Whatever is known is doubtless known by the faculty of the knower. For since judgment comes from the faculty of the person judging, it is logical that he performs this act by his own powers and his own will, not through the constraint of another, as would be the case if we knew things by the power of their essence and according to its law. But all knowledge is conveyed to us by the senses. They are our masters. For by this way the paved path of belief leads straightest into the heart of man and the temples of his mind. Knowledge begins through them and is resolved into them, them being the senses still. After all, we would not know more than a stone if we did not know that there is sound, smell, light, taste, measures, weight, softness, hardness, sharpness, color, smoothness, size, and depth. Here is the platform and principle of the whole structure of knowledge. And according to some, knowledge is nothing else but sensation. He who could push me into contradicting the senses would have me by the throat. He could not push me further back. The senses are the beginning and the end of human knowledge. You will find that the idea of truth is derived first from the senses and that the senses cannot be challenged. What should be thought more certain than sense? Let me ask you, looking at that passage, what role does he give to the senses in acquiring knowledge? Yeah. The basis of us gaining knowledge are our senses? He's pretty much saying that everything must come through there. What do y'all think about that? I have to agree because that's the only way. If I can't hear you, then like, that's how we learn. Like, we can't touch something. We don't know what it feels like. You gotta see it, you gotta taste it, you gotta touch it. Mm -hmm. Our senses give us the experience that we need. Good. So they give us the experiences we need. Well, this is gonna be a problem because, as you can see, the subject heading, right? If you look at the top of page five, what's he gonna argue? That the senses are inadequate. <laughs> um. So let's take a look at the bottom right paragraph and let's now see where he's going to do now. He says, the first consideration I have on the subject of the senses is that I doubt that man is provided with all the natural senses. I see a number of animals that live a complete and perfect life, some without sight, others without hearing. Who knows if one, two, three, or more other senses are lacking in us also. For if some sense is lacking, our reasoning cannot discover the defect. It is the privilege of the senses to be the extreme limit of our awareness. There is nothing beyond them that can help us discover them, no more than one sense can discover another. What do you think he's saying here? Zach? The senses don't provide us with enough knowledge, the knowledge that we need. It kind of, it kind of would go to appearance versus reality that the senses allow us to see or feel what's right in front of us, but that might not always be the truth. It might limit us. What is it, What is he saying is missing? Be, you're right. That there's something deficient and lacking. But what is what is what is he concerned about that we might be missing out on in this passage? Well, an unknown sense that we're not aware of. The other animals that might be lacking some sense of sight. They might have some other senses that we just don't know about. Yeah, I mean, we look at a worm, and this poor worm, it has no eyes. But the worm, we might think, perceives reality in some way. And we say, poor worm, you don't see the reality like we see it because we've got eyes. Well, what if there's some other creature out there that's more advanced than us? And they look at us, and they've got like some other way of perceiving the world, some way we can't even fathom or imagine. They might look at us and say, oh, you poor silly humans. You think that you're understanding the way the world is, but you don't see it completely. How do you know that's not the case with us? Why think that, I mean, isn't that kind of prideful to think of that we would have every way of knowing the world, we would have all the right senses that inform us about the way reality is? How do you know there isn't some, you know, as they say, sixth sense out there that we don't know about? 
can you prove that we have it all? So one of the first things is that even if our senses help us, they don't give us everything we need to know. Um, he thinks that we, we don't, at least he says, there's, it's possible we don't have all the senses that there are, but even worse is that given the senses we have, there are some things that we can't even discover what would be missing. Think about the way like a bat perceives the world. Bats, well, some of them actually do have eyes, but many of them are blind. But they fly and navigate the world just fine. How do, how do bats navigate the world? Yes? Through sound. They let out these high-pitched shrieks, and the high-pitched frequencies bounce off things, and it sort of creates like a sonar effect, where they're able to perceive, maybe I shouldn't even put scare quotes, they perceive the world, in a way that they can like fly and through intricate tunnels and pathways, they can catch small insects with it. Clearly, there's some sensory information that is associated with their sonar pitches, but what that is like is beyond our imagination. We can't even begin to fathom what it's like to be a bat. Um, maybe that's a more accurate way to perceive the world. Um, here's something he brings up on the next page. Um, you can look at it if you like. Uh, this, by the way, may have been related to one of the essay questions that you could have written on for today's class, right? So he says, it is impossible to make a blind to make a man blind by nature understand that he does not see. It's impossible to make him want sight and regret his lack. Anybody write about this essay question? Anybody want to talk about how you answered it? Yeah. Um, I was basically saying that um, I'm you know. <laughs> um, if I, I wrote like if we take the senses as our base for knowledge, um, what I perceive can be something different than another person perceives the same thing to be. Mm -hmm. And um, like if I like colors, for instance, like mm -hmm. I've had arguments with people like that's blue, and they're like, no, that's purple. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wrote about something like that, and like saying uh, basically like neither of us are wrong. It's just like how we perceive things. If someone's blind, and I'm explaining to someone, oh my god, this is so pretty, they're not gonna like, oh, I wish I could see. They just don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they're missing. It's good. Other thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. It basically says that you can't regret something that you never experienced or that you never had. So if someone has ever seen, you can't make them want to see because they don't know what that is. They have no concept. Yeah. Somebody was born blind, they didn't even know. And you say, now picture a red apple. Can they do that? Somebody who is born deaf, if you if you could have you know have them, you can't say it to them, but have them read something that says, you know, imagine middle C, that note. Can somebody born deaf picture or imagine middle C? Um... What happens in this passage with the, the man that he talks about here? This is on, what well, he talks about, this gentleman of the good family. Um, can anybody, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny. I don't know. We feel a little weird, I think, laughing about somebody with a born disability. But what is, what is he saying is going on in that passage? Yeah. The, the man goes about life as if he can see. He kind of, like, um, perceives from what people have told him what sight would be like, so he acts as if he doesn't, he isn't suffering, or he doesn't have blindness, he isn't blind. Yeah, so, somebody puts a newborn child in his arms, what does he say? He said, look at how pretty the face is, or something like that. Do, why does he do that? I think he's saying that he's still expressing like the beauty of a child through something else, like just being around it, maybe. It's pretty good for him. That he's just expressing, he's experiencing it in, through some other way. That would be really nice. Maybe that's true. I don't think it's what Montaigne means, but that's a really nice way to think of it. Um, yeah, Zach? He was trying to respond, I feel like, the way he thought somebody with sight would respond, of um, kind of just overdoing it with the visual aspect of it, because he is blind, he kind of overdoes the visual aspect of it. He's trying to fit in, right? Yeah. He's faking it. Well, 
Um, once again, maybe when we are trying to get at reality, and we're trying to describe the way things really are, maybe we really have no clue what we're talking We're like the blind man here, and we fake it. That's kind of what I, that's kind of like the argument that I went with um, at the end of the essay. Like I said, I, I agreed with that we are like in a way a, like a slave almost to our senses and we kind of perceive reality that way. And in the story of the blind man, I think what he was trying to get at was that being blind was his defect, but that was just the way to show that we're all defective. Even yeah. though if we're not blind, we might be blind to what is actually reality. I think something like that's very much what Montaigne wants you to think, that if you're laughing at the blind man, it's okay because we're all the blind man, um, according to Montaigne, that our attempts to understand reality may just be very much like him. We're going through life and we're just trying to do, we're just trying to make it work. Yeah? Like I kind of connect it to like religion. Mm -hmm. like we can't see a lot of aspects in like different faiths but people just believe it anyway. Well, this is a, where it really connects to this work, right? That this is about this defense of natural theology, this defense of God. Maybe, so forget, when we talk about the physical world, that's one thing. Now let's talk about, how do you, what do you know about God? And you start saying, well, God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's all good, he's the creator of the world. Well, how do you know that stuff? How do you know that our language about God is anything remotely like God himself? That once again, maybe we stand in, our knowledge of God is just like the blind man's knowledge of color. Mm -hmm. Like just like him, we don't know anything about it technically, but we imagine that it's like wonderful, just like as blind man imagines that this baby is beautiful. There's a one thing that's really funny in here, I think, where he's, he actually goes shooting with them. <laughs> and they're like, oh, a little higher, a little lower. I just think it's hilarious to think that he'd actually go, like, hunting, and he's, like, completely blind. Um, think, I mean, we have better gun laws than that. Um, so he's got a, a better kind of thing to say, though, about the senses. So first of all is this business about how do you know that your senses are complete? How do you know that your senses tell you about react uh, are like sufficient to tell you about the nature of reality? How do you know you have all the senses? Yes. Yeah. Uh, like you said that they don't have enough, but we have enough because we're like functioning in our world. Just like the earthworm, it doesn't need to see; it can go about its business, not seeing it, and doesn't need to worry it. So we have why should we concern ourselves with these intangible things that we can never even perceive? So the issue then is. What do we mean by sufficient for what? Sufficient for, uh, for survival? We need to do, yeah. Sure. But the thing that we really want is sufficient to know the truth. Right. To know the way reality really is. Not just how it might be helpful for us to live, but what is it really like? Okay. So he has this statement on page 8. This is another kind of skeptical line he takes in here says, it is frequently seen that our senses are masters of our reasoning and compel it to receive impressions that it knows and judges to be false. Have you ever experienced anything like that? What do you think he's saying here? Hmm? What would be an example of an optical illusion? Or a double sided picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. You ever see something that you thought was way off in the distance and it turned out it was closer, or vice versa? <coughs> Especially like objects in the sky? Um, yeah? Or like a mirage when you're like, like dehydrated. Yeah. Like you think you're like seeing something, but you're really not. I I saw this documentary on Netflix, it's called Titanic, The Last Mystery or something like that. The whole premise of that is that the whole Titanic debacle was largely due to a mirage that effect that takes place when the dramatic wet, uh, temperature changes. It's really kind of cool. Um, so maybe, um, you know, there are things like that take place like mirages. I grew up in Texas. When it gets really hot and you're driving in, the, in West Texas, the road, off in the distance, looks like there's little pools of water, right? But are there pools of water? 
No, it's just a mirage. Um, which line is longer, the top line or the bottom line? How many of you say the top line? How many say the bottom? How many of you don't know the, know the answer to this? <laughs> this is the famous Miller Liar illusion. Um, now, you, you're inclined to believe that the top one is longer, right? But pay attention. I'm going to take the little arrows off the side. They're the exact same length. Um, it's an optical illusion. But your senses incline you to think the top one is longer than the bottom. But they're the same length. Here's another kind of optical illusion. You're inclined to think that there is a there are sort of like two triangles in this top left picture. Your mind almost fills in, so to speak, lines for that. And in this bottom right picture, you're inclined to think that there is a square here. But there's no square. In the bottom right one, all there are are these like four little half Pac-Man things here. There's no square here. Sometimes our senses mislead us into thinking there's something there that isn't there. And this one's cool. You're inclined to think something's spinning or moving on this picture. But nothing is moving. They're all sta standing still. Whenever you stare at one, it stops moving, and then the ones in your peripherals appear to be moving. Your senses deceive you. In this famous drawing, Look at tiles A and B. Is A darker than B? You know that I'm going to trick you, so you don't want to answer. But, guess what? A and B are the exact same color. Look at this. It's pretty cool. These are the kinds of things Montaigne was worried about. He's afraid, well, maybe this is, that's too, maybe that's the wrong word. He doesn't, he's concerned that our senses mislead us, and they mislead us often. But if we go all the way back to what he said in the very beginning, what, are, what role do the senses play in giving us knowledge? They're the most important thing in telling us about not the way the world is. If our senses can't be relied upon, if they have all these problems, maybe we should be a little more humble about our understanding of, um, you know, what we can claim to know. So another kind of theme here um, is then trying to move from, suppose we do take our senses as somewhat reliable. Here's another problem. Our senses can only tell us about the way things appear to be. They can't really tell us the essence or the nature of the things that we are perceiving. Um, on page 10, he has this old example of the uh, of saliva and sea hairs. Um, so, <clears throat> look at the very bottom, um, on the very bottom right on page 10. Um, I'm going to start actually the second to last paragraph there. It says, if the senses are our first judges, it is, not, it is not only our own senses that must be called to counsel. For in re regard to this faculty, animals have as much of a claim as we do, or even more. It is certain that some have more acute hearing than man, others sight, others feeling, others touch, others taste. Democritus said that gods and beasts have sen sensitive faculties much more perfect than man. Our saliva cleans and dries our wounds, it kills the snake. And in these things there is a difference and disagreement so great that what is food to one is to the other biting poison. Often indeed a snake touched by human saliva dies and puts an end to itself by gnawing its own body. What quality do we assign to the saliva? According to us or according to the snake? But which of the two senses shall we verify the true essence of it that we are seeking. Pliny says that in the Indies 
There are certain sea hares that are poison to us and we to them so that we kill them simply by our touch, which is truly poison, the man or the fish. Which shall we believe, the fish of the man or the man of the fish? So here's another kind of issue here. Our senses only tell us how things appear to me. This is kind of related to whoever brought up the thing with color. That, you know, we can talk about what is the, the color. Well, this, this probably would go over pretty well being brown. But there are certain colors that you might, we might have different judgments about. Is it really blue? Is it really purple? Is it violet? Um, is it navy? That maybe it appears one way to one person, it appears another way to another person. You don't know what things are really like, you just know what it appears to be like to be you. And this is going to be kind of a theme for Descartes as well, this difference between appearance and essence. We talk about the essence of something, we want to know what it is in itself. We want to know what makes it what it is. And presumably whatever makes it what it truly is, is not just what's on the surface. What you see about me is not what I truly am as a person. You just see, you know, my clothes and my hair and my skin. But you don't see the essence of me. And for that same reason, when you experience something like water, which you probably think is in here, could be vodka, but um, all that we experience or all that you can experience is the way it looks to you. And if you take a drink from it, you feel it. But you don't know what is the real essence of this stuff. You just know how it appears. On page 12 he says, Now since our condition accommodates things to itself and transforms them according to itself, we no longer know that things, what things are in truth. For nothing comes to us except as falsified, and altered by our senses. So we no longer have the ability to know what something truly is in itself, he is saying. We just know the way it appears to us. One last skeptical concern, and then um, we'll have a little bit of, of discussion about what the whole point is. This is sometimes called the problem of the criterion. And he puts it this way on page 13. To judge appearances that we receive from subjects, we would need a judicatory instrument. To verify that instrument, we would need a demonstration. To verify the demonstration, an instrument, here we are going around in a circle. The problem of the criterion highlights this question. How do we know that our sensory faculties are reliable? You can do it one of, this is sort of the way this is played out in philosophy. You can call, you can go with the methodology, and that's where you say, I've got some method that is, that is reliable. So whatever I do following the method will give me reliable beliefs. But the question is, if you're just starting with a method, how do you know the method gives you reliable beliefs? You're just coming up with some plan out of thin air. You might start with the particular beliefs. So you might say, here are a bunch of things I know to be the case. I definitely know, you know who my parents are, where I parked my car, um, my phone number. And then you say things like, okay, what do all these particular cases of knowledge have in common? What makes them knowledge? But of course, the question then becomes, how do you really know that those particular things are genuine cases of knowledge? Seems like whichever way you're going, you're going to have to beg the question against the other. You can't, trying to figure out a way to prove your sensory faculties are reliable is going to inevitably end up in a circular problem. So that you, think about it this way, if I came up with some methodology and it ruled out all of your beliefs, you might say there's something wrong with my methodology which means that I, you really don't just use a pure methodology. You have to use a methodology that's balanced by the right kinds of particular cases that prove it. To which we then want to say then you have to presuppose your conclusion informing your method. Same thing goes with the particulars. If you started with the particulars, you would be, if I used a bunch of the things that you think are not safe assumptions, if I said here are things I'm going to start with, my belief that 
you know, God is an octopus, that I'm, you know, I am able to become invisible if I wanted to, and um, I also know that um, the world is going to end, you know, in 2015. You would say, well, those are all bad examples of particular things that you know, because nobody's going to think those things are really things that you know. <coughs> so, how do you know which particulars to begin with? I guess you have to, yes, you must have some actual methodology in your background that you're relying on to pick the right particular cases. So, um, that's the problem of the criterion. How do you get this whole thing started? Questions about this one? The very last thing that he raises has to do with this thing about the subject and the object of knowledge being constantly changing. Um, let me see what, if we want to read all of this. Um, let's start, actually, um, let's look at the one on page 14. So look on 14, the top right. I'm going to actually start on the very bottom left. So look on the bottom left where he says, and consequently. Let's just pick up right there and see what he's saying. And consequently, the senses deceive us and lie to us by nature, taking what appears for what is, for lack of knowing what it is, that is. But what is it then that truly is? What is eternal? That is, what has never been born will never have an end, Time never brings it any change, for time is a mobile thing, which appears in shadow, as in a shadow, with matter always running and flowing without ever remaining stable or permanent. Anything to which the words before and after has been and will be is applied shows on the face of it that it is not a thing that is, for it would be great stupidity and a very obvious falsehood to say that to say that that thing is, which is not yet in being, or has already ceased to be. As to the words present, instant, now, by which it seems we chiefly support and found our awareness of time, when reason discovers it, it destroys everything on the spot, for it immediately splits and divides it into future and past, as if it wanted necessarily to see it cut in two. The same thing happens to the nature that is being measured as to the time that measures it. For there is nothing here that either remains or that is subsistent, but all things there are are born or being born or dying. So, there's kind of two questions to think about in this quote. One is, what does he say makes something really true. Like, n how do you know what knowledge of something, of what it really is like? What kind of thing, what would you have to know about it? And then the second thing is, how come we, we fail to have knowledge of things on that standard? So what do you think? What is he saying characterizes, like, true knowledge of a thing? This is what he's saying in the bottom left, mainly. Here. Yeah. Something that's eternal? An eternal truth. So something that doesn't change. Like, if you were to say of me that, you know, I have, that John, sorry, Dr. DePoe, you can't call me that, um, has brown hair, that might be true of me now, but if you knew me when I was six years old, my hair was like bleach blonde. I, you know, I was one of these kids that had that like really fine blonde hair. So you wouldn't be say, saying something that was truly eternal, like an eternal truth about me. You'd be saying something that was just tangentially about me. To say something that was really a truth about me, you'd have to say something about me that was not just about me right now. The same is true of me for all time. And that goes for anything. So we tend, like, how do you know, so then, well, let me put it this way. What is this, the problem with, with this now? If that's our standard for having knowledge of, of things, why do we fail to have it according to him? 
Things are constantly changing. Things are constantly changing. So, <laughs> at least here's the way to put it: is that our no the way that we our perception of things is constantly changing. If there is some kind of underlying stable reality to me as an individual, you don't see that. You see the fluctuating changes on the surface. What else does he say? That's good. This is the stuff about past, present, future, how in, in a moment we split things. What is he, what, do you, what is he getting at with that part? Yeah, Will? I don't think he's thinking about the subject, like the knowing subject splitting. He's thinking about when you, when you say you know something of that thing, in that moment you split that thing by making a claim about it. What are we doing when we... How does that work? Mm -hmm. It like we state our claim and it's in the past. So our knowledge of things, or our claims to knowledge of things, is time indexed. Like we never, it, so it's a similar kind of point, but like when we say we know that something is this way, it immediately makes a claim about the way it, it, it is at this point. We divide it now into the past and, and then the future, because things, it could always be different. Like we say, I mean, we think we know of things that are certain, like um, the inverse square law, which is just the law of gravitational attraction between masses. But that only applies to things that we have observed up till now. It may, tomorrow, it may be different. It may just be the inverse square law, it, you know, operates this way until, you know, February 14th, 2014, and then for whatever reasons, it shifts. You know, the magnetic poles on the Earth, you know, they shift. Why can't the law of gravity change? Our knowledge of things is just about what it's like at that time. Um, there are, so the other quote that we didn't read on page 13 focuses on the fact that we change, that the subject who is making these observations, who is perceiving the world, is changing. And for that reason, our knowledge is unstable. And then what we just read on page 14 is highlighting more the fact that the world itself, the object of knowledge, is constantly changing. And that thereby, since these things are constantly moving, we never get that eternal perspective on things. Knowledge, un knowledge is unattainable. So what's Montaigne's point? I don't have any more point, like buttons to push on this slide nothing that will come up here, so there's not like a right answer. I kind of want to fish for some ideas from you. What do you think he's trying to say in this? Why is this piece called The Apology for Raymond Sebon? I think um, he's trying to get you to realize that you can't think of anything that is eternal, therefore you can't think of besides God. So he's trying to prove that since God is eternal, it's the only thing you can really have knowledge of, or if that is true. But how could we have knowledge of God through our failing senses, our shifting perspective? How, I mean, almost you might say that how does he want to preserve knowledge of God? Something like this is alluded to at the very end here, which is interesting. Yeah? Um, would that go back to how the senses are going back to appearance versus reality and how the senses can be deceiving and not only not always what we see or feel are actually reality and it kind of goes into um, you can't see God but that might be our defect, that might be our blindness that's a sense that we don't have that's part of it but of course then the question I mean, this what y'all are saying is on the right path that I want to say but if, that you're, if that's all there is to it then we shouldn't be able to say we know anything about God but he wants to say I think that we know something about God how is the knowledge of God possible? Mm -hmm. all perception of the line. Like, multiple people will have the same perception of an unlimited being. That would help us if I could get your perspective on things, or anyone else's. I only get my own. That's part of the problem. Yeah? It's like we take documents that were in the past about God and that were people wrote about them and 
we can either perceive this as this is what is true and we're going to go along with this or we don't have to. It's up to you. It's like, as a person, you can choose. There is something to be said about this line of reasoning, too, about that maybe maybe there's a reason why God doesn't reveal everything about himself so plain and obvious to everybody. Maybe God wants to leave room for choice for us. So if God if God would have made us so that we could have that eternal perspective, maybe that takes away our free will with respect to certain things. That's a possibility here. What else does he say? Anybody... I thought this was a very strange conclusion. I mean, if you look on page 15, um, those last couple of paragraphs, I guess it st starts on 14. Anybody think there was anything kind of, I mean, it just feels out of place almost. Is there a way that we can make sense of how those final paragraphs fit in this whole essay about skepticism? Here's the thought I had, and I, I'm not a Montaigne scholar. I'm, I'm more like of the big guys that we have pictures of on the first slide. That's those are the guys I know inside and out. Descartes, I know great. Montaigne, I know I'm shooting from the hip here. But here's one thought I have. Maybe what he's trying to say is he's trying to downgrade the use of reason to know God. That knowing God, maybe according to Montaigne, shouldn't be uh, something that is attained through reason. That reason is maybe the problems that he's facing, Protestant Reformation, people warring and fighting over these things, maybe what he's trying to throw out there is, hey guys, stop using reason to think that you've got the truth of the matter. Maybe the right thing to say is that whatever, if there is any knowledge of God, it's just a matter of faith. It's a gift from God. Not something you can reach and aspire to through your own work. It's something that God has to give you. And if that's the way it works, then maybe we should, be, we should show a lot more humility when we have these arguments and debates about, the existence, about who's right about God. Is it the Protestants? Is it the Catholics? Is it the Muslims? Is it you know, all these other groups that were around at this time? That's one thought I had. Um, that might be it for Montaigne. Um, let me go back just one second here. Are there any questions about anything else in the essay? This was like a really super speedy, fast overview of Montaigne. Something I would have liked to drag down for like another 45 minutes. Um, anything, anything else that you wanted to talk about or anything else from this essay that you think we need to talk about that I didn't go over? Yeah. Um, about the inverse square law, isn't it? I, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know the proof, but I'm pretty sure it's logically proven, like mathematically. It wouldn't matter if the planets didn't show it; it would still be true within the system it exists. Within. It's not like an, it's not a self-evident axiom. Yeah. So it's not like an a priori truth that we could demonstrate apart from, from evidence. So the sense in which it's proven is only in the sense that observationally everything that we have seen in the past conforms to it. Okay, what, what are you talking about how it affects like the real world? Yes. Okay. So for all we know, it could all change on, you know, on Valentine's Day. Okay, I'm just that, yeah. I, I, was, I was thinking the other way. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I just found it interesting, the second to last paragraph where it says, Who with one single mouth feels always and there's nothing that is truly real but God alone without one's being able to say. So it's like the only thing that you can really know is God himself. Because he's the only thing that's eternal in nature and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So once again, maybe the theme here is to sort of push down the pridefulness of human reason and elevate the role of faith or elevate, you know, this other kind of thing that is supposed to be different from human knowledge. The Stoics, which 
One of the things that happened with Montaigne is he resurf a lot of his writings reflect the rediscovery of ancient skepticism. There were all these ancient skeptics that wrote about skepticism, and uh, their works were lost for a good period, and then they got rediscovered. Um, the Stoics had a very similar kind of outlook. The Stoics believed that one reason we should try to teach people to be skeptical of ideas is that the skepticism is good for us. It keeps us from going to war, it keeps us from being too from executing violence on one another, that um, we only have those kinds of problems when people say that they know more than they are entitled to say that they know. So a healthy dose of skepticism is maybe good for human nature. And perhaps that's the same kind of idea that Montaigne is doing in this essay. It's pretty neat. Um, let me talk a little bit. Normally, I break our class up in, into three sections like having th uh, two breaks. I'm going to, for the sake of time, just push us through about another 20 minutes, if, you, if we can bear it. Um, so let's get started talking about Descartes. Um, here's you know, the usual portrait associated with Descartes. They put Descartes on money. That tells you, I mean, he must be important, right, if you're on money. So um, Descartes is featured on a lot of different French uh, money. Um, we're going to start talking about um, his, his discourse on method. Here is, I think, a copy of the first of one of the first edition uh, covers here, the inside pages. That's cool. Um, a few things to be looking for as we go through this essay. One is the proper use of reason. Second is reason being the mark of human nature, and Third, it's just kind of interesting that this essay fills us in on some of Descartes' own um, autobiographical story. When you think about scholarship at, at this period, scholarship was like almost entirely done in Latin. Descartes writes this piece not in Latin, but he writes it in French, a language that was accessible to just about, well, anybody with a basic education. So already that tells you a little bit about his philosophy and the things he's trying to do here. The piece is, as we've said, by autobiographical in spots. Um, it explains the way in which he has gone through his own philosophical journey. Um, and we're going to be looking at the role of reason in his method and... Um, at the very end, his argument about animals not having minds, which is a favorite for many people. Uh, let's go ahead and just take a quick look. Let's open up page 25, and let's read this first paragraph, very famous first paragraph. Good sense is the best distributed thing in the world. For everyone thinks himself to be so well endowed with it that even those who are, with, who are the most difficult to please in everything else are not at all wont to desire more of it than they have. It is not likely that everyone is mistaken in this. Rather, it provides evidence that the power of judging well and of distinguishing the true from the false, which is, properly speaking, what people call good sense or reason, is naturally equal in all men, and that the diversity of our opinions does not arise from the fact that some people are more reasonable than others, but solely from the fact that we lead our thoughts along different paths and do not take the same things into consideration. For it is not enough to have a good mind. The main thing is to apply it well. What's he saying in that passage? Mm-hmm seems like everybody, he's saying that everybody has the same ability of reason, it's just the way they go about reasoning, the path that they choose to go about forming their reasons. Excellent. So, everybody's got it. Reason is something that is common to all humanity. Um, we arrive at different opinions because we take different paths. Uh, what is he defining? There's a, like a parenthetical statement in here. What does he define reason as? Let me just pick up on that little gem. What does it mean to have reason or good sense? 
Distinguishing the true from the false. So, this ability to distinguish true from false is what it means to have reason, and everybody's got it. So, good sense or reason is the ability to judge what is true from what is false. Um, if everybody's got it, why are there so many different opinions about the truth of things if we are all equipped with reason? We've already touched on this, which is that um, people take different paths. People aren't careful about the steps that they take when reasoning. So here are some important implications just from this first passage. One is that reason is an essential mark of humanity. This is a kind of a classical view of human nature. What is the essence of being human? Um, the ancient philosophers, many of them said to be human is to be a rational animal. And Descartes is clearly in that kind of tradition, except there's no animal here. All he's saying is what it means to be human is rational, rationality. Um, another important thing to think about here is what we might call egalitarianism. Um, the idea that we are equal. That philosophy, therefore, is accessible to all people who are willing to apply their minds to it. Philosophy is not something for an elite few, like the, di the wealthy who can afford the right kind of education. Um, the other book that the other book you were required to have for this course, the Women Philosophers of the Modern Era, the editor who wrote that book, she believes that Descartes is kind. She doesn't use this word, but she does kind of think he's like a feminist in a way. Why? Because Descartes says everybody's got reason, that includes the ladies, and furthermore, the way that he does philosophy doesn't require you to come from aristocracy, to come from the right education, the right background. He's just saying, he, he, want, he wants to say this is accessible for everyone. This is actually really, you might think, if you've had some philosophy, which all of you should have had by now, if you're in this class, you might think that this is maybe obvious, that philosophy is the sort of thing that everybody can do. It's an accessible discipline. But that's not the way it was in his time. That it was an elitist kind of thing. It was done by people who had the right parents, who had the right money, who had the right, all the, the right education, and so on. And so it was completely inaccessible to the, the uh, common person. Descartes once envisions philosophy as being something that is not just for those types. Um, so let's, one of the other things we'll look at in part one um, are the way that he describes his different studies. Um, so this is just kind of an interesting thing to look at the way that he describes the, the way he went through his education. He found some things valuable, other things not so valuable. He talks about poetry or oratory. Um, he talks about that these are the kinds of things that you would l do well at or you would excel at if you were gifted in it. You can't really teach people how to be good poets or how to be good uh, speakers, that these are just things you're born with. So he didn't really find that to be very helpful to study poetry, or at least how to write poetry, how to deliver speeches, because you're either good at it or you're not. It's a natural capacity, not something you learn through study. Um, mathematics was something, and this was highlighted in the presentation that was done, that mathematics he loved. He thought mathematics was awesome because he loved the fact that you could start with certain basic givens, postulates, axioms, and with <coughs> that system build up absolutely certain conclusions from them. So by following careful proofs that um, uh, that started with uh, absolutely certain given points, you could realize really interesting conclusions. But it, however, the problem is pure mathematics, he thought, didn't have much use besides what he calls the mechanical arts or engineering. So that while it's really cool that you can figure out the uh, measure of interior angles of triangles or the way that parallel lines have certain features with a bisecting line and so on. The problem here is that mathematics 
doesn't really give us much knowledge of the way the world is. This is really important because he's going to model his philosophy on, on the, the way mathematics is done, but he's obviously not doing mathematics. He talks about theology, and to this he just kind of humbly declares that he's not capable of understanding these truths that we take, uh, you know, that they take us beyond reason. I don't know if he's really sincere about this. Um, there are different views about this. So you might think that Descartes really is just being honest here. Or you might think he, I mean, he doesn't want to come out and call theology BS and get in trouble with church folks. So maybe he's just trying to find a nice way to not talk about theology. He talks about the sciences. He says, insofar as they borrow their principles from philosophy, one could not have built anything solid upon such unstable foundations. So this is a, a statement that is supposed to be critical of the way philosophy is done in his time. In his time, the reigning philosophy is called scholasticism. Scholasticism is basically an, a warmed over version of Aristotle's philosophy. Aristotle lived, let's say, roughly in the 4th century BC. Descartes is in the 1600s. From the 4th century BC to the 1600s, Aristotle has been the ruling paradigm of philosophy and science. Well, science, did, there was this thing called the Dark Ages in that period. It's called the Dark Ages because we didn't really advance much in knowledge. Why was that? Well, Descartes would say it's because we were relying on Aristotle's philosophy. That Aristotle's philosophy, while it has some good points, doesn't give us what we need to um, have the foundations for science. So, here's something that Aristotle thought. Aristotle thought that the bodies make sure I get this right. Do I have that on here? No. Alright. He has this idea that the bodies of... I might get this backwards. It's one way or the other. He, the bodies of men are hotter than the bodies of women. Like hot in the sense of temperature. Why? Because men's bodies are generally larger than women's bodies, therefore they generate more heat. As it turns out, that's not true. Um, women's bodies are run just a little warmer than men. But Aristotle arrived at that conclusion because he was thinking about philosophical principles, like larger things must be hotter because they're bigger, as opposed to going out there and like measuring, making observations. And so much of what goes into Aristotelian philosophy is like that that they went, instead of actually making observations and studying things, they came to conclusions like, well, heavier objects fall faster. Why? Because heavier objects are bigger. And we all know, I hope, that that's not true. Heavier objects fall at the exact same rate as smaller objects. That the size of the object does not affect uh, how quickly it falls. So, er, what he's doing here is he's picking on Aristotle, saying that Aristotle's philosophy was not very helpful in doing anything in science. This is also going to be very helpful to remember when we get into the meditations. He abandoned his formal studies when he was old enough to travel. So, he was, as y'all heard in the presentation, his parents wanted him to get a great education. The problem um, was that um, he didn't really care for much of his education. He, uh, I guess he appreciates it to some degree here, in certain aspects of it, but he made it sound like in here that he was, as soon as he was able, he was done with it. And he took to traveling. Um, There's this really cool thing he says about why it's good to travel. I wanted to read this on page 28. Um, Look on the very bottom on that paragraph that spans the two columns. It says, This is why as soon as age permitted me to emerge from the supervision of my teachers, I completely abandoned the study of letters, and resolving to search for no knowledge other than what could be found within myself or else in the great book of the world, I spent the rest of my youth traveling, seeing courts and armies, mingling with people of diverse temperaments and circumstances, gathering various 
um, experiences, testing myself in the encounters that fortune offered me, and everywhere engaging in such reflection upon the things that presented themselves that I was able to derive some profit from them. For it seemed to me that I could find much more truth in the reasonings that each person makes concerning matters that are important to him, and whose outcome ought to cost him dearly later on in life, later on if he has judged badly, than in those reasonings engaged, on, engaged in by a man of letters in his studies which touch on speculations that produce no effect and, and are of no consequence to him, except perhaps that the more they are removed from common sense, the more pride he will take in them. Once again, this is just slamming this, er, this scholastic philosophy. For he will have to employ that much, more, mu that much more wit and ingenuity in attempting to render them plausible. Um, in the next paragraph, this is in the middle of it, um, he says, I learned not to believe anything too firmly of which I had been persuaded only by example and custom. And thus, I little by little freed myself from errors that can darken our natural light and render us less able to listen to reason. So, what are the benefits of traveling? What do you think traveling does in our education? What can it do, at least? Mm -hmm. Perhaps at that time, um, people like in the same area would talk to each other and have the same beliefs. So if you were to move around a lot, you could get a lot of different perspectives. That's one big thing. You get much more perspectives, and without the internet or even really reliable like mail and other kinds of things, how do you get different perspectives? The only the best way to do it back then was to go and travel and immerse yourself in them. What else does he say here? There's something really related, really closely related with Travis. It's a slightly different point, but what else would, is the value of traveling? What does he say in that last bit I read about? What does it free yourself of? Well, testing what he had learned um, through letters, his true observation. So you can make real observations. I'm looking for one other kind of thing here about what. What are the mistakes that we can fall into if we don't travel, perhaps? What might we be inclined to, to do? Yeah? Make assumptions that are removed from common sense. So one of the things is, this is related to the earlier part, which is that, for one, if you just st spend your whole life in this like ivory tower doing philosophy, you might arrive at some really bizarre conclusions and, ha and it has no grounding in the way people ordinarily think. So he wants, I mean, we'll revisit if you think Descartes succeeds in this, but you might think that being a part of everyday life will help you stay grounded in reality. There's another kind of thing here, that's really good, there's another kind of thing I'm looking for in this passage. What, what does he say traveling frees us from? That last paragraph right above part two. Mm -hmm. Well, he's saying, like, little by little, he was free from, um, he was free from, it says, like, the, the errors that can darken our natural light. So basically, like, what we, what we already had, like, a perception of, like, as traveling and learning different um, new experiences, what he wants to see to be one thing was traveling and gained knowledge of, he like, it changed like his outlook on what he was perceiving. There are certain things we pick up ev through our life just as a matter of like habit and custom. It's the way it always was. My parents say, you know, maybe you, you, you learn certain rules like no chocolate chip cookies for breakfast. Why? Because that's just the way it is. Nobody has, that's weird. But what if you move to a country do they have chocolate chip cookies to breakfast? You might come to realize maybe that's not so weird. It's only weird to people who live like my parents do. Or, you know, that you, uh, you, have to, you have to drive on the right side of the road. And if you drive on the left side of the road, that's weird. It's also dangerous. Don't do that right now. But it might not seem so weird if you go travel to places where they do things differently. 
And the thing that, it's not just about weirdness, it's about the idea that you would accept the customary things as if they are obviously true, or that these things are like some kind of enlightened way of being. He says that it's a good idea to travel around because it will prevent you from making that mistake of thinking that the ordinary customs that you were raised in are somehow special. Is it kind of saying that the his traveling aided him in becoming more well-rounded in his paths of reason? Like it kind of helped him become more uh, stronger than, than if he were to just stay in one place. Like you said, um, one place you might drive on one side of the road, but the other place you might drive, and that acceptance kind of builds those paths that lead to reasoning? I think that's right. I mean, there's essentially two directions he's pushing with this. On the one hand, traveling enlightens you by exposing you to more. And on the other hand, it also frees you, it exposes, so to speak, the errors that you might be inclined to accept if you didn't travel. So you might fall into this, this customary way of just accepting the way you were raised as the right way. And by traveling around a lot, you might be more at least open to the idea that the way you were raised may not be necessarily the right way. Um, let's take us to part two. Oh, I've got even a little thing on this. So custom and example can keep us from seeing truths delivered by the natural light of reason that we all possess. Um, so we, this is another theme to look for. This natural light of reason is something that's going to come up in the meditations. And he thinks that custom and example can keep us from seeing the insights that come from that natural light of reason. And we'll say, have more to say about that later. All right, let's take a pause here. We're at part two. Um, we'll take a quick break. Um, let's give it 10 minutes, and then we will resume from here.